And, uh, and before our keynote speaker uh, comes up here, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mr. Litt. And, uh, but before that, I just want to say how pleased I am with the participation of our area schools. I've, I think I mentioned NC, UNC and NCCU, but we have a large contingent here from East Carolina. And we have a very large contingent from Elon Law School, and it's just wonderful to see that. And we also have a representative from Charlotte Law School and many other institutions, and I really think that's great because, uh, and, and Bob may agree with me on this, that this national security law community is growing, but in a way it is kind of a, a small community. So getting to know each other, there is real, real value of that, especially as you go out and get in practice. I can remember I went to a course uh, at the Naval Justice School uh, right after I had gotten out of war college on this standard law of armed conflict, and I uh, met some people there. Next time we were together is in Mogadishu in Somalia, so you just really never know. So these personal connections are important. And I encourage you, again, especially the students, to go up and introduce yourself to our speakers and our panelists and to each other, actually. Now, having said that, let me just do a very brief introduction of, of Mr. Litt. And it's just tremendous, Bob, that you were able to uh, fit this into your schedule to be our keynote speaker. Uh, as you can see from his um, biography, he went to Harvard, went to Yale. We're trying to overlook that, and we invited him anyway, but uh, Duke, of the North. <laughs> Duke of the North, exactly. And he also was a partner in Arnold and Porter, but as you can see, he has committed himself to public service. He's done it in several different uh, positions. He continues to do it, probably one of the toughest general counsel jobs around. Don't tell Steve I said that tomorrow night or tonight. But really, uh, and there was, we were chatting before, there was a portrait of him on, in the Washington Post not too long ago on the front page. And um, the Washington Post had to concede what a great lawyer he, was, he is. And that he's honest, he's forthright, and he is, this is my word, feisty. Would, would that be, is that a compliment or no? Uh, he is everything that you would want to have in, in a lawyer. And, but I really do think that when the Washington Post describes you as honest, hardworking, and fighting for your client, and it's in a situation that, say, they're not editorially supportive of, I think, uh, I think that says a lot, and it says all kinds of good things. Without further ado, uh, Mr. Litt. Charlie, thank you for the, uh, for the generous introduction, uh, and thank you uh, in particular for uh, inviting me to speak uh, right after that absolutely spectacular panel, um, which is going to be a tough act for anybody to follow. But, but this is a terrific conference. I, I spoke here a number of years ago, uh, and I enjoy coming back. Uh, about seven months ago, six weeks after the press began publishing the classified documents that Edward Snowden has stolen, I gave a speech at the Brookings Institution. Uh, and in that speech, I focused on two particular intelligence collection programs that had been the subject of leaks. One of them was the bulk collection of telephone metadata that was referenced in the question asked earlier of Judge Walton. And the other is the targeting of communications of non-Americans located outside of the United States pursuant to Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which I think was also referenced in the last panel. I suggested in that speech that in a time of rapidly changing technology and expectations of privacy and of a massive explosion of information, the best way to protect both national security on the one hand and privacy and civil liberties and constitutional rights on the other hand was through a system of strict regulation and oversight over the way the intelligence community collects, retains, and disseminates information. And I described in some detail how that system works with respect to those programs. Um, you'll be relieved to hear that I do not intend to go over the same ground I covered in that earlier speech. But if you're interested, 
Uh, the intelligence community has set up a website to post a bunch of material relating to surveillance, including the declassified opinions and other things, which is uh, icontherecord.tumblr.com. Uh, and I recommend that to you as a resource if you're interested in that area. But much has happened since I gave that speech in July. The leaks have continued, and they've become more and more damaging to our national security as they focus more and more on the specific sources, methods, and targets of intelligence collection, and less and less on broad issues of policy. The President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technology and the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board have issued reports and made recommendations. The Director of National Intelligence, my boss, has declassified dozens of formerly classified documents, including, as Judge Walton mentioned, a number of significant opinions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Numerous bills have been introduced in Congress. Foreign governments in the EU have expressed significant concerns that have spilled over to affect bilateral and multilateral <laughs> relations. And the President has issued a directive instituting certain changes in how we conduct signals intelligence and has ordered that further changes be continued. But I don't think that anything that has happened has undercut the central thesis of my speech or, in fact, demonstrated that the procedures we have in place today are insufficient to protect privacy and civil liberties. It is noteworthy that in all of the material that has been leaked so far, there is no evidence at all of any kind of systematic abuse of willful attempts to violate the law or of the misuse of intelligence for political or other improper purposes. Nothing that has been revealed over the last seven months approaches the scale and scope of the abuses of intelligence that were, were revealed in the 1970s. And any comparison to those abuses is simply hyperbole. What I'd like to do uh, this morning um, is uh, take a step back from the daily leaks, many of which have been inaccurate or sensationalized, and talk about a few of the broader issues that the events of the last few months have raised. In particular, I'd like to consider some questions about how the intelligence community should operate in an era of big data, about the manner in which intelligence activities should be regulated and overseen, and about the importance and the difficulty of transparency in an inherently and necessarily secret enterprise. So let me start with the promise and the problem of big data. I should begin by cautioning what is obvious. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an analyst. I'm a lawyer. And for a layman like me, it's sometimes easy to get your mind around what big data really means. Uh, there was a post on the MIT Review of Technology last October that listed a half dozen or more different definitions of big data. And, and I'm sure it's a coincidence entirely unrelated to commercial interests that Microsoft's proposed definition talked about the use of serious computing power, and Oracle's proposed definition talked about relational databases. Um, <laughs> Uh, for today, however, I think that the most useful uh, approach to big data focuses on what you do with the data. Big data does, does not just mean a whole pile of data. It's large quantities of data which often come from different sources. It can be unstructured or it can be structured and formatted in different ways. But you can analyze and evaluate this data using sophisticated tools to try to reveal interesting and provocative information or correlations that would otherwise be invisible or obscured. But also, in the context of intelligence collection and analysis, big data means data that may contain large amounts of non-pertinent information, along with information that is of legitimate foreign intelligence value. The amount of information that exists in the world today is, is mind-boggling. According to one study that was uh, done a couple of years ago, every day we create 2.5 exabytes of data, which I believe is 2.5 billion billion bytes of data every day, or the equivalent of filling up 60 billion iPads with new data every day. By another estimate, 90% of the digital data that exists today was created within the last two years. So that's a, a massive quantity of information out there. Where do you find it? Well, you can, it, it's available from commercial brokers. It's in, in public available sources like social media. There are private and public surveillance cameras gathering data. There's communications and communications metadata. And there's a lot of data that's already in the government's possession because it's been lawfully collected pursuant to one authority or another. Private companies have been making use of big data for some time to answer questions that were previously 
too difficult to answer with traditional data science. And we're all familiar with some of these examples. Retailers use big data to figure out how prices, demographics, economic indicators, internet use, and even the weather come together to affect sales. Financial firms use it to identify potentially fraudulent activity. Social media companies use it to target ads on their websites to make the individual user more likely to click on them. And if big data is useful to private companies, you can imagine its appeal for intelligence professionals whose job it is to uncover hidden information. Within that huge mass of information that we're generating every day is information that we can use to disrupt terrorist plots, to find foreign spies, to detect illicit transfers of nuclear weapons, or to stop cyber attacks. Big data solutions could help us sort through this information, find the relevant information, and deal with these challenges, challenges which, for the sake of our nation and our allies, we need to meet head on. Let me just offer a couple of examples of the ways in which we might use big data. We've all become, in recent months, familiar with the concept of communications metadata. That's information about communications, such as the number dialed and the length of the call. It's not the content of the communication. It's not even the identities of the parties communicating. But, it can, but even so, it can be very useful to intelligence analysts. And if you collect and analyze metadata in bulk, it's a form of big data. For example, if we collected large amounts of metadata about foreign telephone calls, we could get useful information from that by making targeted queries about persons we've already identified as potential threats. But another way we could use big data, <coughs> metadata from, tel from foreign telephone calls, is to compare it with other data bases of information that we've collected and employ big data tools to see if we can identify previously unknown terrorists or other persons of interest as a basis for further inquiry to help us narrowly and appropriately focus how we use more intrusive collection techniques. Another potentially fruitful use of big data comes from the explosion of open source information that's publicly available on social media. In the aftermath of the Arab Spring, numerous commentators pointed out the important role that social media played in that up social upheaval. Analysis of this kind of publicly available information can help give policymakers early warning of and a deeper understanding of trends around the world. And just to give you a concrete example of that, a couple of weeks ago, IARPA, which is the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity, the, the, the intelligence community's equivalent of the better known DARPA, IARPA reported that simply by monitoring publicly available information, it was able to identify outbreaks of disease as much as two weeks before they were either reported in the press or announced by the local health authorities. So that gives you an example of the, of the analytical power of some of this information. At the same time, there are obvious and legitimate concerns about, our, about permitting intelligence services to collect and analyze large data sets that, by definition, will include a lot of information about people who are not foreign intelligence targets. The same capabilities that allow intelligence analysts to extract important information about terrorists, spies, or cyber threats from large quantities of data could, in theory, also be abused to extract information about ordinary people. So looked at in this light, big data starts to look a little bit like Big Brother. That doesn't have to be the case, in fact, because big data is all about looking at large quantities of information and extracting pattern and trends, it doesn't necessarily requiring ty require tiring in, let me try that again, it, it doesn't necessarily require tying in information to individuals. Patterns can emerge without the need to examine or investigate the individual dots that make up the pattern. But there is no doubt that the collection and analysis of big data by the intelligence community poses concerns that are different than those that are posed by more traditional targeted collection and analysis. That's one reason why the government has been moving relatively slowly in this area. So the question I want to pose is, what do we want our intelligence community to do with big data? On the one hand, we could conclude, as some have advocated, that the collection and analysis of large amounts of data is inherently so dangerous and so susceptible of abuse that we should bar the intelligence community from doing that at all. The other approach is to recognize the promise as well as the problem of big data and to allow its use subject to appropriate regulation and oversight. I expect that the way I frame the problem gives you a sense of where I come out on the answer, but I want to explore this in a, in a little bit more depth. 
The first approach essentially asks our nation to forego the possible benefits of big data for the intelligence purposes because of the risks to privacy and civil liberties. There is, of course, a real risk that any intelligence tool can be abused or misused in the future, and that's not a risk that we should downplay or minimize. But the risk of abuse does exist with any tool, with any authority, and with any person using those tools or authorities. That is why, over the last few years, we've erected an elaborate and multi-layered structure overseeing the activities of the intelligence community. And this oversight, in fact, works. While the intelligence community's record of compliance in recent years is not spotless, as Judge Walton, Walton alluded to, again, I, I will mention and, and emphasize that it does not reflect that there have been any systematic abuses of the authorities we've been granted. There are, of course, legal limits that are imposed by the Constitution and various laws on what we could do with big data. Just to pick one relatively obvious example, the Fourth Amendment would prevent the government from collecting the content of all communications taking place within the United States, no matter how useful that might be for law enforcement or intelligence purposes. So as I discuss this issue going forward, I'm going to assume that we're talking about using big data in a manner that's consistent with the law. In my view, telling the intelligence community that it cannot collect and analyze big data because of the risk of misuse it's a little bit like somebody going to Kitty Hawk in December 1903, looking at Orville and Wilbur, Wilbur Wright flying a flimsy wood and fabric contraption for about 100 feet, 10 feet off the ground, and making a decision that this aeroplane is way too dangerous and its potential benefits far too speculative and we shouldn't allow it to move forward. That's about the stage we're at today in our understanding of what can be done with big data and about our understanding of how our use of that data can be made safer. Moreover, as with airplanes in 1903, the United States is not the only nation exploring the use of big data in furtherance of its national interests. Uh, a couple of months ago, I testified at a Senate Judiciary hearing, and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island said, quote, if we were to pass a law that prevented our intelligence and defense establishment from operating in the big data atmosphere, we would be essentially unilaterally disarming in an arena where other governments are very active. So consideration of the appropriate role of big data in our democratic society reflects the changing nature of privacy in the information age. Today, we all share an enormous amount of personal and sensitive data with private companies and, in many instances, with the entire internet-connected world. And yet, we still want this information to be private for many purposes. In particular, as I said at Brookings, we feel very differently about sharing large amounts of data with the government than we do about sharing it with private companies. Not because of the nature of the information itself, but because we're concerned about what the government could do with that information. But I don't think it's going to be very productive for us to pretend that big data doesn't exist. The Luddites did not win. Mechanized textile manufacturing carried the day. The more prudent and more far-seeing, if less simple, approach is to deal with the problem where it exists. If we're concerned about how government can use data, let's craft uh, sensible limits on the way we can use that data, what purposes we can use it for, who can use it, so that we can all be more confident that we're protecting both national security and privacy. At the end of the day, we need to determine whether there's a system of controls and oversight that can be put in place to give us comfort that our intelligence services are using big data appropriately. I think there could be such a system. We can impose strict limits on the purposes for which the data could be used. We can impose limits on the types of analytical tools that could be used against it and how information could be disseminated to others. We could set up approval and review processes to ensure that these limits are adhered to. And we could use technological, technological tools of the type that now exist to restrict and monitor access to the data to further enforce the restrictions. We could place limits on how long data can be stored in our databases, and we could use the existing compliance and oversight framework to proactively discover mistakes and quickly fix them. If this approach sounds familiar, it's because it's exactly what the intelligence community already does. In fact, it's, it's pretty much the approach that we took with respect to the bulk telephone metadata program, as I laid out in more detail at Brookings. This regulatory framework goes far beyond the controls that most, if not all, of the private sector has with respect to its use of information. And while the NSA has had well-publicized technical challenges in implementing the bulk telephone metadata program, 
As Judge Walton noted earlier, these problems were self-identified, self-reported, and self-remedied, thanks to NSA's robust compliance and oversight system. <coughs> This telephone metadata program has been criticized, and the President has determined that it's going to be ended in its current form. But nobody who has looked at this program, not the review group, not the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, not the President, has suggested that this program was abused or, at the, or that the controls were inadequate to prevent abuses. I think that this model is the, way, is the right way to approach the problem and the promise of big data. Now, you may have noticed that as I was describing this, I talked about the decisions we might take about how to regulate and oversee the intelligence community's use of big data. This, of course, begs the question, who is we in this context? And that's the next general topic I want to talk about. The problem is a familiar one. Intelligence must, by its very nature, be conducted in secret in order to be effective. We simply cannot advertise what we are collecting, where we are collecting from, who we are collecting against, and how we collect it without compromising our ability to protect the nation. At the same time, the nature of the intelligence business and the potential and actual history of abuses requires that there be strong and credible oversight to provide assurance to the public. Since the 1970s with the Church and Pike Committees, that oversight has largely been accomplished through the Select Committees on Intelligence of the House and Senate. By law, we are required to keep these committees fully and currently informed of all intelligence activities, and we do. We provide them hundreds of finished analytic products every month. We provide them dozens of written and notifications and dozens more briefings every month. These cover the full range of activities from covert action to personnel actions to satellite constructions to the latest state of play in, in Ukraine or Syria, and they include a, a, all information about our intelligence collection programs. The Intelligence Committees also exercise oversight through annual authorization bills and the classified annexes to those bills, which often provide very detailed prescriptions, directives, and reporting requirements. Much of this takes place in a classified format, and a small portion of the most sensitive material is briefed only to the committee leadership. But the intelligence community takes its obligations to the Intelligence Committees very seriously. In effect, the system that we have set up delegates the intelligence committees as the people's authorized agents and representatives in overseeing intelligence. But their oversight, just as the activities they oversee, must be largely conducted in secret. In addition to the uh, intelligence committees, there's oversight within the executive branch and from the judiciary. Within the executive branch, the oversight of intelligence activities is conducted by inspectors general, General's counsels, privacy and civil liberties officers, and the Department of Justice looking in from outside. And we work hard to instill a culture of compliance in every intelligence officer. And the FISA court provides independent judicial review to ensure that activities that come within its jurisdictions are operated in compliance with the law. Indeed, at the President's direction and with the court's approval, its role in the oversight of the bulk telephone metadata program has recently been expanded. The court must now review any proposed query against that data to determine that it is appropriately based on a reasonable, articulable suspicion that there is a link to terrorism. All in all, I think that the oversight of America's intelligence activities that exist today involving all three branches of our government is far more extensive and effective than exists anywhere else in the world. But in the week, wake of Snowden's leaks, each of the pillars of this oversight structure have been called into question. As you heard earlier, the FISA court has been called a rubber stamp. The executive branch has been accused of whitewashing problems. Some members of Congress have claimed that they were uninformed of important matters and have criticized the intelligence committees. And the media and advocacy groups have called for much greater disclosure of information about collection programs than has been the norm in the past. In short, the entire question of how intelligence activities should be overseen has been reopened. This discussion is going to play out at some length over the next few months, but I want to offer some observations on each of these issues. And I do want to emphasize that these are my own thoughts, and they don't necessarily represent the views of the ODNI, the intelligence community, or the administration, but I hope they'll provoke some thought. Let me begin with the FISA court, and I will say that uh, Judge Walton has stolen a lot of my lines here, but I'm going to repeat them anyway. Um, <laughs> There have been a number of proposals for reform on how the court operates, uh, including changing the process by which judges are selected for the court, 
uh, allowing for the participation of independent advocates in some cases, requiring greater disclosure of court opinions. I think that these proposals should be considered and evaluated with a few general principles in mind. The first is that it is important to remember that the FISA court is a unique institution. Historically, the conduct of foreign intelligence activities has been viewed as a core responsibility of the president and the executive branch. I know of no other country that has the same degree of judicial involvement in the authorization and oversight of foreign intelligence <laughs> activities that we've given to the FISA court. Second, because of this unique role and because of the classified nature of the activities it oversees, the FISA court is not like other courts. When we think about how to change it, we should not take as our lodestar a traditional Perry Mason-like adversary proceeding. As was noted earlier, even in ordinary courts, proceedings relating to the gathering of evidence, such as the issuance of search warrants or electronic surveillance orders, are typically conducted ex parte and in secret, even though they may involve important legal or constitutional issues. Third, we've already made significant strides in providing uh, public insight into the workings of the court. We've done this by declassifying and releasing many of its significant opinions and orders, and the court itself has published some detailed descriptions of how it does its business. The process of releasing opinions was underway even before the leaks began, and appropriately so. But reviewing a document to determine what can safely be released consistent with national security is a complicated task. And I do have to say that in this instance, the illegal disclosure of certain collection programs did affect how we viewed the balance between transparency and national security. And even apart from these leaks, we're continuing to review documents uh, uh, relating to the FISA court, pleadings and opinions and so on, in the interest of providing as much information as we can about national security. Finally, and I want to emphasize this point, the FISA court has historically and currently operated effectively, independently, and appropriately. And I would say that even if Judge Walton was not sitting 10 feet from me. <laughs> Um, the, the opinions that, that we have released have shown that the criticisms of the court as a rubber stamp are plainly and simply wrong. It's true that the court makes its decisions ex parte and in secret, but it's also true that it has outstanding and experienced judges and a capable professional staff that provide searching review of the government's su submissions. These are the same judges, after all, who have written opinions bluntly criticizing the way that we've handled certain compliance pro uh, incidents and collection programs. And in fact, I think that as these opinions have come out, you've heard less and less about the idea that the FISA court is a rubber stamp. Having said all that, I recognize that we do need to take steps to restore public confidence in the court and how it operates. For these reasons, the administration does support the proposals to provide some, a, a panel of cleared lawyers that the court could call upon to, to provide independent advocacy in cases that, are pro, that involve significant issues. Hopefully, if this process is instituted, it will help to ensure that the public's perception of the court's independence and integrity matches the reality of its independence and integrity. Similarly, restoring the public's trust may require that we establish even more oversight of intelligence activities within the executive branch. It's, it's a basic truism that the more people who are watching over intelligence activities, the harder it is for anyone to abuse their authorities. The President has already directed that some changes be made to strengthen executive branch oversight of certain intelligence activities, including, for example, annual reviews of intelligence priorities and sensitive targets uh, to ensure that we take into account the risks as well as the benefits of signals intelligence activities. But increased oversight comes with costs. Intelligence already, as my colleague Stephen Preston has said, essentially a regulated business. And just as with any other business, more regulation produces more complexity. We shouldn't impose so much regulation and oversight on our intelligence officers that it stifles their ability and willingness to be creative and aggressive within the law in defense of our nation. I'm reminded of a comment about Bobby Knight, if I can mention that name in this town. Um, <laughs> supposedly, uh, Coach Knight was so overbearing that his players ran up court on the fast break looking backwards for instructions. <laughs> We don't want our intelligence officers to be looking backwards for instructions all the time. And we should also bear in mind that the more rules and processes we create, the more opportunities we create for violations of those rules. Intelligence officers are by and large not lawyers. 
They need to clearly understand what they can and cannot do. So in terms of executive branch oversight, we need to find the sweet spot of appropriate regulation that does not bog down a necessary element of our national security. Let me turn now to the third pillar, the issue of congressional oversight. As I said earlier, the accommodation that we've made as a nation between the need for oversight and the need for secrecy has been to empower the congressional intelligence committees to serve as the representatives of the public. In my view, this is a wise approach. Intelligence is a complicated business and one that must be kept isolated from partisan political pressure. The intelligence committees, which have a tradition of nonpartisanship and an experienced and knowledgeable staff, have been pretty good at doing that. But this historic accommodation is now under great stress, in part from some members of Congress who have said they weren't adequately informed of intelligence collection activities, and in part from other critics who think that the intelligence committees have not been sufficiently vigorous in their oversight. I do want to be clear about a couple of things. We informed the intelligence committees about the bulk telephone metadata collection and the Section 702 collection, as we were required to do. And some members of the committees, internally within the committee's deliberations, raised questions about these programs. Those questions were discussed within the intelligence committees, debated, and the great majority of the committees were satisfied and supported the programs after these com concerns were fully debated. Unlike the public at large, the intelligence committees have deep insight into the threats facing our nation and the importance of intelligence collection activities to protecting us from them. The real complaint of many of the critics is not that oversight was inadequate, but that they disagree with the result that the authorized oversight process reached after full consideration. That's an issue of policy, not the adequacy of oversight. Second, the charge that Congress was not adequately informed about these programs is entirely and in some instances hypocritically misplaced. As I've said uh, on previous occasions, we made information about these programs available to every member of Congress at the time the relevant statutes came up for reauthorization. And members of the Intelligence mm -hmm. Committees, in fact, made statements in the congressional record urging all members to go and review this information. Any change in the way that Congress conducts its oversight of intelligence activities has to take into account whether those who would conduct the oversight are willing to take the time to understand the activities that they would be overseeing. Finally, I want to talk about transparency. The value of transparency is more than a little counterintuitive to agencies who are, uh, whose operations depend on secrecy. But I do think that the events of the last few months have taught the intelligence community that we lean, need to lean as far forward as we can in disclosing information about what we do. As a result of this, we have been more open than we have ever been before. We've de declassified thousands of pages of documents. We've testified at open hearings. We've come and made speeches. Uh, and the President has made clear that he wants this openness to continue, and it will. Greater public disclosure is necessary to restore the American people's trust that the intelligence activities conducted on their behalf are not only lawful and important to protecting our national security, but are appropriate and proportional in light of the privacy interests at stake. In the long run, our ability to protect the public requires that we have the public support. But lines must be drawn. First and foremost, we cannot allow transparency to compromise our sources and methods. We will have to continue to protect information about the specific targets of intelligence collection, the specific methods by which we conduct that collection, and the specifics of the intelligence we collect. Were we to announce to the world, for example, that we have the ability to intercept emails using particular email services, we would enable terrorists, cyber criminals, foreign intelligence officers, and others to migrate to other email services so that they could communicate without fear of detection. We may never know in those circumstances what we're missing until it's too late. We can be and we will be more transparent about how we interpret the laws to support our activities, about the procedures and the oversight we have in place to ensure that our intelligence activities are lawful and appropriate, and about the degree to which we have or have not followed the law in, 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 and, and our policies in our operations. But if intelligence becomes too transparent, it is useless or worse. I think that greater transparency about our processes, for example, could help us cope with one of the principal failings I see in the current discussion of intelligence activities, which is the failure to distinguish among what the intelligence can do technically, what it can do legally, and what it actually does. 
Too much of the recent discussion has focused on the technical capabilities, which are often fascinating, while leaving a misleading leading impression of the actual activities. For example, you've all seen, I'm sure, press reports about NSA's activities in breaking encryption codes. I'm not going to comment on the truth of any particular stories or any particular allegations, but isn't breaking encryption exactly what intelligence agencies are created to do? <laughs> we know that our enemies use encryption and other techniques precisely to avoid surveillance. NSA's job is to figure out how to break those techniques, and its capabilities are unmatched in this area. But saying that NSA has the technical capability to break encryption is different from saying that they routinely spy on the encrypted communications of ordinary Americans or foreigners. They don't. All of NSA's technical expertise is brought to bear in furtherance of its authorized foreign intelligence mission and within the law. But it's, it, it has been difficult for us to push back against mischaracterizations without making un, unless we make clear the basic procedural framework uh, that describes what the limits are and how these limits are enforced. And that's what we need to do going forward. All right? And this leads to the other question I want to raise about transparency, which is who should be responsible for deciding what is secret and what is made public? Decisions about what can be disclosed consistent with the public interest require an appreciation of both sides of the equation both the value of transparency and the value of secrecy. I do not think we can survive as a nation if we let those decisions be made randomly by individuals who cannot comprehend the full scope of their actions. The exposure of intelligence capabilities can result in the waste of millions of dollars, in a degradation of our ability to give policymakers the warning they need to deal appropriately with threats, or in extreme cases, it can result in the loss of lives. That's why we go through a careful, thorough, deliberative process before we decide to disclose previously classified information to ensure that we don't endanger capabilities or lives. Leakers disrupt this process by taking it upon themselves to decide what should and should not be withheld from public view. They usually do this without understanding the full context for the information they release and in willful disregard for the sensitive sources and methods that they're placing in harm's way. Leakers, in short, conclude that they know more than everyone else who has considered these issues, including the legislative and judicial branches that have continuously endorsed the principle of classification for national security reasons. Individuals in the intelligence community who want to blow the whistle on genuine fraud, waste, abuse, or illegality should do so. We expect and require our officers to report instances where they believe the law is not being followed or where people have acted in ways that violated our internal procedures and guidelines. We have established procedures to allow members of the intelligence community to raise these concerns with appropriate authorities, including inspectors general and Congress, without risking harm to our national security and without facing reprisals for these disclosures. But what is most striking to me about these leaks, at least from my perspective, is that they really aren't properly characterized as whistleblowing at all. None of these leaks has shown that the government was engaged in any willful violation of the law. Even those who disagree with some of the legal analysis supporting our activities have to acknowledge that these activities were deemed legal by the FISA court, the Department of Justice, and the lawyers in the intelligence community. None of these leaks has shown that the intelligence community was engaged in widespread activities that were hidden from its authorized overseers. Instead, the argument appears to be that the intelligence community has engaged in behavior that certain people disagree with as a matter of policy. In my view, that is not an adequate justification for the risks to national security that these leaks have caused. So wrapping up, I just want to summarize a couple of the main points I've touched upon. Regardless of what critics charge, the intelligence community operates within a framework of law and oversight. As we contemplate the challenge of big data, we should look to apply that same framework of law and oversight to ensure that we can make use of the multifaceted information now available to us and that we don't make inappropriate use of it. And as we contemplate changes in how in the intelligence community is overseen, we should bear in mind how that oversight has operated in the past and the dangers of imposing so many rules and bureaucratic procedures that the intelligence enterprise becomes ineffective. Finally, we recognize that to a degree far beyond what we ever contemplated before, 
We must give the public a better and more complete understanding of the processes and procedures we use to guide and regulate our intelligence activities. Public confidence in the way we conduct our necessarily secret activities is essential if we are to continue to respond quickly to the many varied and changing threats our nation faces. Thank you. Mr. Lid has very kindly agreed to entertain some questions. Oh, I'm sorry, in the back. I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts on it. Um, there's been a request to expand the amount of time that data can be held. Um, do you have any thoughts as to what specifically should be a, a cap or a higher end as to how long data should be able to be held? So I'm, um, are you referring to the, the press reports this week? So that was a, um, a response to the fact that there's litigation. Um, the, there's no, there are uh, established minimization procedures that already govern how long we can retain information. And th th that time period varies for different kinds of data depending upon the, the need for the, the uses for which we're holding it, the privacy implications of the data, and so on. And th they can range from short periods to longer periods. What happened in this case is that there's litigation pending challenging certain uh, collection activities. And the ordinary rule in litigation is you can't destroy potential evidence in the litigation while the litigation is ongoing. So that's all, that's all that that was about. I mean, they, they, I, th I think the Department of Justice just felt they have to go to the court uh, before, before they do what they would ordinarily do, which is destroy this, inf this data when it reaches its, uh, its expiration date. Judge, Judge oh, Davis. I, thank you for your remarks. Uh, very, very, very illuminating. Uh, if you can tell us, I, I suspect many of us in here are curious to know um, what steps have been taken or might be contemplated to prevent the next Snowden. How, how, how onerous, if that's the correct word, have things become for for the officers and contractors who, who work in the agencies? So that's a really good question. Um, it, it's one that we're still working through. NSA has already immediately put into place some uh, steps to try to uh, eliminate the specific vulnerabilities. Um, for example, you know, Snowden was a system administrator, and uh, that means he had lots of authorized access. They've now put into place a two-person rule. Somebody has to be looking over your shoulder. Um, we are sort of in the middle right now of installing a lot of uh, technological tools, auditing and monitoring. This is, in fact, another use of, of, of big data to, uh, to identify uh, abnormal uses of things. Uh, in the long run, though, um, there's no substitute for trust in the individuals. I mean, if I were to decide to be faithless to my oath, um, all the technical challenges in the world couldn't stop me from causing grave damage to the United States just because of what I know based on my uh, job responsibilities. And so um, I think the, the, the real lesson for this is that the intelligence community has to operate going forward, always asking itself, what happens if this gets leaked? Which is not a question that I think we've historically asked ourselves uh, enough. Let's, let's go with the student in the back and then We'll work our way forward. Okay. I was wondering if you could comment on some of the proposals to uh, transfer the data, that the uh, bulk metadata that's collected and stored. I've seen proposals to move it into private hands or FBI, I think I saw recently. Well, I don't want to, um, I don't want to front run a decision the president's going to make. That, that's, that's not a career enhancing move. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I will say that we're that you know there's there's a spectrum of options that could be considered. From on the one hand, taking the program as it currently exists and providing more controls to uh, to give people greater confidence uh, about the way it's used, to 
uh, having the telephone companies retain the data, uh, which I think it's been publicly stated that the telephone companies don't like that idea, to having some sort of third-party entity uh, hold the data, which creates all sorts of issues about what that entity would be and what the privacy implications would be of giving all this data to a third party, to simply letting the program expire and trying to do the best you can with other authorities. Uh, we're working through all of them. The President's given a deadline of March 28th. Uh, given the way things uh, have been leaking to the press, I expect you'll be reading about it on March 29th. <laughs> this gentleman, I, uh, I asked all the <clears throat> people asking questions if you could state your name. And your My name is Richard Ellman. Um, <clears throat> Edward Snowden was a contractor, not an employee of the department. As a contractor, does the agency still exert the same restrictions, constraints, et cetera, on him as though he were an employee? And second part is, why do you use contractors as opposed to employees? Uh, on the first point, yes, any, any contractor who has access to classified information has to go through the same background check and sign the same non-disclosure agreements as an employee does. Uh, we use contractors for a couple of reasons. One is that you may have noticed that over the last few years, there's been tremendous pressure to decrease the size of government. Um, one of the results of that has been an increase in the number of contractors. But in the IT area in particular, um, there are frequent, there, the skill sets frequently aren't available in employees. And, and frankly, you can get better service and better capabilities from contractors. Um, there are Lots of contractors. I don't believe that contractors are inherently any less reliable than intelligence community employees. Many of them are former intelligence community employees themselves. Um, it, it's a reality we have to deal with. Okay, one quick re attack. One, one of the things you said was that a goal to reduce the size of government. Is this really not increasing the size, decreasing the size of government? Because he's still working for the government. The only difference is he's not in the head counts. I, I'm not going to get into policy questions. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wells. Bill Wells, uh, Air Force Industrial Facilities from Terrio Command. Uh, this is a, a contractor question. A bit technical in personnel rules, but it's been in the news recently that certain corporations require whistleblowers who bring things forward internally to sign agreements not to further disclose it to anyone, including the government. And I can see where that could block some of the whistleblower rules. And what thought uh, have you had a chance to give to contractual requirements to limit this sort of whistleblower access restriction? for contractor employees? Um, what I can say in that regard is that we're very, um, we are cognizant of the issue of um, whistleblower protection for contractors. Um, there are some things in the works on that already. Um, I, 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 I saw the press article. I don't have any firsthand knowledge of that. But I do think that the general principle should be that, that somebody who wants to make uh, a disclosure of, of a wrongdoing through appropriate channels should be protected from reprisals, regardless of whether he's an employee or a contractor. Albert Jannon, Naval Special Warfare Command. Sir, um, to the extent it's unclassified, can you describe the scope and persistence of foreign power or corporate collection of, of American citizen data? I mean, there seems to be such a lopsided discussion, and the net is open to everyone. Um, well, corporate collection, obviously, it, it, it's not classified. And I, I mean, I don't think I have anything to contribute to that other than what we all read in the newspapers about what, what, is, what corporations uh, mine about us every day. Uh, there's no question that foreign powers are seeking to get information about us and that they are using whatever capabilities they have to, to spy on Americans as well. Um, I, I probably can't go into a lot more detail than that about it, but I think that um, we, we, there certainly have been public statements about the, ex the extent of economic espionage conducted by foreign powers against us. Bob, can I pose a, a question to you while others are thinking? Uh, 
Whoops. And state your name, too. <laughs> I'm a legend in my own mind. <laughs> Bob, uh, we have quite a few students in the audience. Uh, you've been in big law. You've been in government. You go back and forth. Uh, what advice would you, how did, how did you get into interest in national security? And what advice, if any, would you have for students? I am so glad you asked that question. Because, I, be, because, because I love to, uh, to proselytize to law students about the, 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 the benefits and the joys of, of public service. Um, and the, the, the line that I use, and I truly believe it to be true, is that uh, except for twice a month, the worst, the worst days in public service are better than the best days in private practice. Um, the twice a month is obvious. Um, I, I, started out, I started out as a prosecutor. I uh, then went to private practice for a while. I went to the Department of Justice and got involved in national security stuff, and, and here I am. Um, I, I would urge anybody that the, the kind of satisfactions and rewards that you get from knowing that every day you are trying to, to benefit the people in some way. And, you know, my, my particular field right now is, is national security and intelligence. But you can, you can provide benefits to, to the public in a whole lot of ways, in the government, in, in, in NGOs or, 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 uh, or, or a variety of organizations where, where what your job is, not, not to put not to be too crude about it, but what your job is to try to, in, in some sense, benefit the public good as opposed to help uh, one company screw another company out of $10 million. Um, the, the, the satisfactions of the former are immense. Uh, in terms of advice, from my pers particular perspective, there are two bits of advice I would give to law students. Um, the first is, if you want to go to work in government, don't take only the sexy courses. Um, I get across my desk when I have a job opening, I get lots and lots of people gradu who graduated from law school who have taken a course in national security law or human rights law. What's, what I really need, I'm a general counsel. I need people who know administrative law, who know federal procurement law, who know human rights law. If you really want to make yourself marketable to a, a government agency, um, eat the spinach as well as the ice cream. Um, <laughs> And, and the second point that I would make is to beware the golden handcuffs. Um, if you go to work for a law firm, um, you're going to very quickly be making more money than you ever dreamed you would be making. Um, in, uh, in 1993, when uh, Bill Clinton was inaugurated, I was a partner in a Washington law firm. Uh, and uh, I and a number of my other partners wanted uh, very much to go into government. Um, I was able to do so. Many of them were not because they looked at the mortgage on the million dollar house, they looked at the three kids in private school, uh, and they said, I can't afford to do this. So if you really want to, uh, at some point in your life, do public service, plan for that now. Don't take on the big mortgage, don't incur big expenses, don't get used to the ridiculous law firm associate salary. Um, plan, plan ahead, save your money, and then you'll, you, won't be happy that, you won't be unhappy that you did it. Almost, sometimes it pays maybe to entertain just a few more questions. Professor Curtis. I'm going to fill in this vacant period uh, here. Uh, <laughs> I, my question has to do, your title... Your job title is, uh, okay, here, let me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Now, my question has to do with whether or not you're cleared at your level to discuss uh, the implications, the implementation of the virus that was used to deal with the Iranian Centrifuge? No. <laughs> Emma? Hi, hey, I'm Emma Camamone. I'm a student. I just wanted to ask about the big data implications um, for getting security clearances. As students, we're all interested in that. Sort of any of your advice on that front? Um, I mean, you all, you, I mean, I shouldn't be telling you about this, okay? Um, I don't have a Facebook page. Um, but, um, but it is true that people um, have to 
you know, again, it's really hard when you're 18 years old to be thinking about what things are going to be like when you're 35. Um, the difference is that when I screwed up when I was 18 years old, it evaporated. There was no record made of it. Um, we're in a different environment now. I can tell you that in part because of the, the question that was asked earlier about what do we do about Snowden. We're going to be looking at social media in the security clearance area. We're going to be looking at it historically, and we're going to be looking at it currently. Um, and people just need to understand that this is a resource that's available. Um, I f we need to figure out what conclusions we draw from the fact that uh, somebody got drunk at a party and took a stupid picture of themselves. Um, but that information is out there, and it's going to feed into the process. Thank you. Um, Phil Carter, CNAS. If you date the programs from about 2006, which I think at least one of them dates from, it's been approved by, by my count, five Congresses led by different parties, two presidents led by different parties, and at least several federal judges appointed by presidents of different parties. And there seems to be an odd and uh, maybe unprecedented bipartisan consensus and support of the national surveillance programs that you've described. What explains that, in particular, the continuity between the two administrations, where you now have a Democratic political appointee defending things quite articulately that began during the Bush administration, and vice versa, where former officials are some of the loudest champions of what this administration is doing? So uh, first, to, uh, to uh, uh, just comment on your uh, statement about a bipartisan consensus uh, from your lips to God's ears. Um, <laughs> um, it's not clear to me that that part of bipartisan consensus still exists. But I think to, to focus particularly on the issue of the, um, uh, the, the sort of continuity across administrations, I think this is an example of what I talked about, about this sort of necessarily nonpartisan nature of intelligence. Um, the country needs to be protected from the same threats. And we have a limited arsenal of tools. And I think that every president who comes in looks at the threats and says to himself, I don't want to be the person who dismantles these tools. And as a result, uh, the national power grid is, is uh, shut down by a cyber attack. I don't want to be the, per the president who allows the next 9-11 to happen. And so you know, you one, there's a, a necessary pressure towards protecting the nation. That's, that's what the job of the lawyers is, to, to limit that, to say, wait a minute, you, you can't do that. And the political process to say, we don't want you to do that. But I think it's, it's not at all surprising that there would be continuity in administrations in the determinations of, of, of matters affecting national security. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Brenna Rajanti, Elon Law. Um, my conflicts of law class is here, and um, we're looking at the fact that um, one of the conversations we had was it, it, it seems slightly disingenuous when um, foreign officials or people in, in foreign countries, you know, really got on board with um, lambasting the United States after Edward Snowden's revelations came out, when it seems like everybody kind of knows that all of this intelligence gathering is going on all over the world at all times. And so... I'm interested in the, the the lack of borders that are going on now with how we're doing our intelligence, both nationally and internationally, and looking at foreign governments and how that shifts based on what kind of government it is and whether they're an ally or not, and if there are different parameters that you um, would be able to talk about. There's a lot packed into that. Um, um, I, I, if I can speak... Um, oddly a little bit in defense of the, um, uh, w w what may seem to be hypocrisy in foreign countries, and which to some extent is hypocrisy. But it's also true that in part because of the way international communications are structured, in part because of the resources that the United States has, and in part because of the role we play in the world, we do a lot more than most other countries in the world do. And so if the, uh, if the Swiss intelligence service is conducting intelligence service operations, it's probably less likely to be of concern to people around the world than, if the, than what the United States intelligence services are doing. Um, in terms of your comment about, if I understood your question about uh, how we um, 
conduct surveillance activities against different kinds of countries. Obviously, we, for both uh, practical resource uh, and political reasons, we're going to conduct different kinds of intelligence activities uh, against different nations and, and, in, in, and, um, and in different places. I mean, there are some countries in the world with whom we have a very, very close intelligence partnership. Um, there are other countries in the world who are our most significant and important targets. Um, we're going to conduct our operations differently uh, in, in those two countries. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I think Mr. Litt will be around for just a few minutes afterwards. And I'll, I'll be around for a while. And Bob, you've given us a lot to think about, but uh, one of the things I most appreciated about your presentation was your your description of the importance of public service and some of the realities of making those decisions to serve. Thank you very much. 15 minutes, or 14 minutes. <laughs>